some blow into the face. Those teeth were lost while alive. Oh, wow. Are we even sure that this is mummified? Trauma was very much in evidence in this individual's life. Extensive damage to the rib cage area. Whether that's in fighting or, or people coming in from outside. Somebody's caring about this person. And what we need is some good, hard scientific facts. Mummies. Human remains frozen in time. These bodies, preserved through natural or artificial means, have been found all over the globe. Each one contains in its fragile form a glimpse into a lost past, the distant world its owner once inhabited. In a hidden corner of a London museum warehouse lies an ancient Peruvian mummy that's hardly seen the light of day in almost a hundred years. Most mummies from ancient Peru were either bundled in a fetal position or laid out flat. But for some mysterious reason, this Peruvian mummy seems to have been buried in an unusual cross-legged posture. This is just one of the puzzles that face the mummy investigation team. Their lead investigator is Dr. Joanne Fletcher. Hi, it's Dr. Fletcher. Good, good afternoon. Come in. An Egyptologist who's examined mummified bodies from around the world. Right. Are you ready? Oh, wow, look at those feathers. At first glance, this looks more skeleton than mummy. But these ancient bones are actually covered with the remains of soft tissue. Initially, this mummy would probably have been wrapped in multiple layers of precious textiles to form what's known as a mummy bundle. Fantastic surface detail, though. Really Quite a lot so. of damage, but, but these lovely little details of the sort of the loincloth and the headdress. It's clear from the start that this mummy has a fascinating story to tell. Museum conservator Emma Duggan is hoping Joanne can help her unravel it. Well, I have to say this is a really extraordinary looking individual. Uh, do we know if it's male or female? We don't, sadly, no. Do we know what culture it's from, what part of the world? Uh, we do have records that state South America, possibly Peru. Right, right. Um, have we any idea of date? Uh, it's quite a large banding. It's between 800 and 1400 AD. So n not too precise not at the moment. Not too precise at that. Right. No. right. Any idea when it when it came into the, the country? We don't. We know it was uh, collected on behalf of the Wellcome Trust oh. for Henry Wellcome, but we don't know who exactly collected it. Uh, we don't have any records as right. such about it. This remarkable mummy belongs to the hundred-year-old collection of philanthropist Henry Wellcome founder of the Wellcome Trust. I mean, the first thing that we notice is this terrible damage to the ribcage area. It's almost completely crushed on one side and the right arm appears to be detached, so... It is detached, yeah. Terrible damage yeah. going on at some stage. The other thing is this textile, it's like a, a fishing net of some sort, isn't it? it? Is, so yeah. that suggests some clues. And then, obviously, you've got this, this kind of finely woven sort of headband and incredible remains of, of a sort of feathered headdress. Yeah. That really is stunning, isn't it? Very well cooked. I think I'll need quite a, a lot of time to sort of just undertake a visual examination. Would that be OK? Yeah, I can leave you to it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the body is wearing a headdress and what looks like a fishing net. Joanne has already named him the fisherman. Much of the body is in a poor condition, but despite the obvious damage, these mysterious remains contain the secrets of a life long gone. The challenge for the team will be to unlock those secrets, and centuries after the fisherman died, 
retell the story of his life. Members of the Mummy Investigation Team have been working together at the University of York since 1999. The team brings together a rare combination of experts. Duncan Lees is a forensic archaeologist. He specializes in 3D modeling using the latest laser scanning equipment. With a mummy, it's just unequivocally a person. You know, you pick a mummy up and it's still all intact and all together. Egyptologist Jill Scott is also a human remains expert and works as the team's main archive researcher. I'd be really intrigued to find out more about their burial mm. practices and potentially where this person was found. Dr Stephen Buckley is an archaeological chemist with an international reputation. His analysis of mummification techniques puts him at the forefront of his field. Despite very small samples we can get a great deal of data and of course the more data we have then the more we can say. Before the body of the ancient Peruvian can be examined firsthand, the initial clues come from Joanne's photographs. There are some extraordinary mm. details here. I mean look at the headdress for instance. There's remnants of the textile on the head mm -hmm. with the feathers the in that. Yeah. Now as soon as I saw the net I thought chinchorro because well the, who? the, the chinchorro it's, it's basically a, a sort of fishing culture in um, the sort of what's now Peru, southern Peru, northern Chile, around that border right. area. The Chinchorro were a prehistoric fishing community. They are best known for being the world's oldest mummy makers over 2,000 years before the Egyptians are thought to have started. In London, the different members of the team start their investigation of the body. Stephen Buckley gathers hair, linen and wool samples, crucial elements for chemical analysis. He's hoping to provide details of diet, drugs like coca or even poisons, as well as revealing how this person was preserved. He'll use GCMS testing, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, an advanced forensic technique employed in law enforcement. It can identify substances left as trace elements on the hair or skin. You can end up with several telephone directories of, of data for um, just uh, two or three samples, so there's plenty to go through. His painstaking investigation may shed light on the mummy's status, where it came from, and perhaps even the cause of death. Forensic archaeologist Duncan Lees is often called in to create accurate 3D images for crime scenes and anti-terrorist investigations. One area that particularly interests Duncan is the mummy's unusual burial position. This could hold the key to who the fisherman was. Laser measurement technology allows him to bring objects like the mummy back to life through a virtual 3D animation. Data on the precise shape of the mummy is fed into the computer at a rate of 20,000 measurements a second. This equipment is so precise, the model it builds is accurate to within the thickness of a human hair. It is creating a, a data set that is highly accurate and allows you to take uh, the mummy back to the office, if you like. Some objects are you know, robust and solid and, and you could study those and not really cause any damage, but the mummy that we have here and many other sort of human remains are, are very delicate things. We need to treat them with respect. Duncan will go much further than merely reproducing the body in a digital form. The image he's creating will enable the team to virtually reanimate the mummy and discover more about who he was and how he was buried. The story of how this Peruvian ended up in London could be crucial to the investigation. A little over a century ago, Sir Henry Wellcome began using the profits from his pharmaceutical company to create a large collection of historical wonders. From excavations and expeditions across the globe, Wellcome and his team collected hundreds of thousands of objects. With so many new artifacts appearing each month, many of them were not fully catalogued. 
At its headquarters in central London, the Wellcome Trust now has over a million objects, many of which are on display. We know that the mummy was bought for £10, but I don't understand where and, and by whom. We know extremely little. What we do have are a few scraps of records. So this is the uh, catalogue from August uh, 1929, uh, and we think this is the record here. So a series of mummies were being sold, and item 594 says a collection of five Peruvian ditto, that's mummies, without cases. With little direct information from the collection's records, the team will have to rely on the body itself for evidence. Rose Drew is a bone specialist who's worked extensively with Native American and Peruvian human remains. Her in-depth physical examination of the body should at the very least help confirm our mummy's sex and age. On a, on a brief look, I'm thinking possibly male, but I really need your opinion on this. What do you think? Well, the first thing I want to, want to mention is that I do see a nice brow ridge up here. The side of the eyes with the lateral orbit, you know, that's nice and thick. Uh, the brow is nice and developed. In between the eyes and above them a bit, that's nice and firm. So, yeah, that's a very male characteristic. That, that really is. Some, some, uh, some women can develop that, but that's very well developed. So I would, I would lean toward male, I would lean toward male. I would sometimes do a little bit of sexing off the mandible, and then the chin can be square in males and more pointy in females. That's a nice pointy female-ish chin. Don't you find this, this person is very, very gracile, very, very slight? Yeah, that's, that's right. When, that's, that would be one thing that you'd really notice, yeah, yeah. that is overall just a, a gracile, delicate-looking individual with very uh, lightweight bones. Overall, the study of the mummy suggests it's male, albeit an androgynous one. From the bones, Rose is also able to tell his age. This right here is your clavicle, you know, top bone up here. It's um, that's fully fused. That part fuses any time over the age of 25, generally 28 on up. So that's fully fused. That puts this individual at 30s to 40s minimum. Teeth are often used in determining a precise age, but they can't help in this case. All the mummy's teeth are missing. When a tooth falls out of a socket, the socket can fill in in as little as six or eight months with some kind of new bone. Mm. And so that's been filling in in the back, so his molars have been gone for a while. The jaw shows signs of severe infection. But up here, there's a huge abscess. This is a healed abscess, actually, and it really ate into the bone. And that can release a lot of bacteria into the bloodstream. This gives us our first direct insight into this man's life. He suffered from chronic toothache and infection. But since the abscess had healed, it's clear that even though the infection was serious, it was not the cause of death. Most experts believe that, unlike the Egyptians, the Peruvians preserved their dead using natural techniques. That meant wrapping the bodies in fabric, then allowing them to simply dry out. But Joanne's initial inspection makes her think this body may well be an example of mummification using artificial techniques. I'm sure this individual is mummified because you've got a, a plug around the backside there to stop the fluids coming out, mm -hmm. you know, from the rear. But and not yet, completely. Not completely because we've certainly got a lot of corrosion to the soft tissue here. After death, the internal organs putrefy and the resulting liquid contains bacteria which rots the flesh. The accepted wisdom is mm. all Peruvian mummies were naturally mummified. Right, they were right. Up obviously, in the mountain, yeah. wrapped in a blanket. Yeah, mm. with, with the, the, the no sort blanket. of natural environment doing right. the job. Right. The extent to which this guy was mummified really does need to be explore, explored further, and the only way we can do that is by scientific analysis. To establish whether the body was artificially mummified, the team will have to wait until the results of Stephen Buckley's chemical analysis come through. But from the initial examination, it appears that this withered body was male and around 30 years old at the time of his death. Duncan Lees has completed the first stage of his 3D analysis. Using his virtual reality technology, he's identified the key articulation points for the limbs and is now able to stretch the fisherman out to his full height. We're looking at the, the laser scan data. I've 
If I play this animation now, you ready? <laughs> that Stretching is out a bit. fabulous. And uh, we have a magical height of uh, 133, which I brought a tape to show you exactly. That oh. is four foot four. No way. Tiny. Which is not even up to your shoulders. And this is a 20 year old? Mm. 20, 30 year old? 30 year old. 30 year old. So diminutive. Standing a little over 133 centimetres tall, this man was tiny and compact. The physical picture of the mummy is building up, but identifying his culture will be vital to understanding his history. Dr. Nick Saunders is an anthropologist specialising in ancient Peruvian cultures. Joanne hopes he'll be able to confirm her hunch on the fisherman's ethnic origin. I really need your opinion on this because uh, all we know is that this is the mummy I told you about, the Wellcome Trust, and basically what we've got is something that, well, I don't know, could it be Chinchero, do you think? Uh, absolutely not. But let's, let's have a look um, at the photographs here. You can see by the design, the colour, and the way the red and blacks are, are, are formed um, on this headpiece. And, and this photograph in particular, you can see a narrow strip there of, of delicate uh, textile work. The detail and sophisticated weaving on the cloth are definitely from a more advanced culture than the Chinchorro, but which? These two things almost certainly point to the central coast of Peru. So coastal? Fishing community, fishing village probably, but yeah. coastal Peru, and certainly not uh, anything to do with the Chinchorro further south in what is today Chile. Discovering that the mummy is not Chinchorro makes the team refocus. We've got a, an adult male, mm -hmm. I mean, fairly androgynous looking individual, yeah. it has to be said, but not, apparently, of the Chinchorro culture. How, how come not Chinchorro? Well, Nick's had a look, and from various sort of cultural pointers, he, he doesn't think it's Chinchorro. It's probably more northern, so a kind of central Peruvian culture. Maybe Chimu, maybe Chancay. It's something we need to pin down further with the science, really. Well, I'm uh, hoping that we'll get something from the GCMS. Mm. In the meantime, we've got the, uh, the C14, the radiocarbon, and right. the uh, paleo dietary analysis. Yeah, to uh, give us an idea of what he was eating. Well, on the back of that, I also think if we did some more textile analysis to try and mm. pin down the nature mm. of the fabrics yeah. around the head and the headdress. With Chinchorro now ruled out, Joanne thinks that the mummy may have belonged to the Chancay civilization. The Chancay lived close to where Lima is today, back in the 14th and 15th centuries. Crucially, this group were famous for their ceramics and textiles. They were a farming community who grew maize, peppers, pulses and sweet potatoes and added to their diet by fishing. But perhaps most important, they interred their dead seated with their possessions to take to the afterlife. The fisherman with his straight back, splayed feet and strangely crossed legs seems to fit the pattern of a seated mummy, another possible indication that he was Chankai. In the lab, Stephen is preparing samples for carbon dating, hoping that science will provide some answers. Carbon dating is a method of determining the age of organic objects less than 50,000 years old. All forms of life take in and store carbon from plants, a process that stops only at death. Because carbon-14 decays at a known rate, the amount left in a sample can reveal how long ago that organism died. If the carbon-14 date falls between 1200 and 1500 AD, it will place the fishermen in the correct time frame for the Chankai. While the team probes the mummy's culture, Joanne is keen to figure out more detail about the man himself. She thinks the net around his body indicates that he was a fisherman. If he was from a coastal community, they might have buried him with the tools of his trade, essential for the afterlife. His headdress, on the other hand, suggests high rank, maybe even a shaman or leader of his community. Joanne has commissioned Duncan James, a historical costume specialist, to recreate the likely headdress 
to see if this offers any clues about the mummy's social status. Duncan has researched the feathers used in the original, and the result is impressive. Are these the Yes, I mean, there's the tail feathers, which oh, um, are sort of rather impressive. So in, in terms of our mummy, the fact that he's wearing a, a feathered crown, a feathered headdress, what, what does this tell us about his status? What did feathers mean to these ancient mm. people? Well, feathers were extremely important because partly they relate to the idea of spiritual flight. The nature of political and religious power in ancient Peru was based on access to the spirit world and the ancestors. So the people who were in charge um, showed that connection by um, wearing brightly colored feathered headdresses. So the bigger the headdress was, the more um, feathers there were, the more spiritual power this individual had. And that showed with the sun shining and glistening uh, on the feather headdresses. So they're extremely important um, symbolically and religiously. Would anybody be able to wear them? So if somebody went out and hunted sort of a, a brightly coloured bird, would they have been allowed to wear them or would it only certain people allowed to wear them? Only certain people are allowed to wear feathers uh, in certain combinations. Size and elaborateness depended on status as well. And we have right. to bear in mind that these were in our own terms, incredibly expensive objects. Mm -hmm. They were traded vast distances from the other side of the Andes in the tropical Amazon rainforest. Uh, and so they were a real high status tribute uh, object. So this is a real status marker that we've Absolutely. got on our mummy. It really flags him up as, you know, an important individual mm -hmm. within his own community. That's right, yeah. Brilliant. This is a real breakthrough. The impressive headdress shows that the mummy must have held a high position in his society. Perhaps he was a shaman, a warrior, or a village chief. It also appears to eliminate the possibility that he was an ordinary fisherman. In coastal parts of Peru, the sea, with its harvest of fish, was a vital source of food. Fishing communities would have sought ways of associating themselves with the sea. So perhaps the net symbolized nothing more than the coastal community to which the dead man belonged. Diet can also help identify a culture. Using the hair sample Stephen Buckley took from the mummy, the team hopes to establish exactly what he ate in the months before he died. Dr. Andy Wilson will conduct the analysis. Andy has worked on a range of mummies from South America and is one of the world's foremost experts on ancient hair. Human hair grows at around one centimeter a month. Working from the root, which is the most recent growth, the hair can show what the individual has eaten over as many months as there is hair to work with. Andy plans to use stable isotope analysis, a test often used by the police to track down terrorists and drug smugglers. The first stage is to find out whether the hair strand is strong enough to undergo sampling by using a scanning electron microscope. This highly sensitive machine is able to magnify specimens of hair like these 2,000 times. It focuses a beam of electrons on the sample to achieve this extraordinary magnification. Duncan joins Andy at the microscope to establish whether the mummy's hair is in good enough condition to provide meaningful information. So in essence what we're doing is, a, is like a quality check on the sample to see whether we can get results from it. Very much so. Andy suspects the hair fragment is unusually short as it's been attacked by insects over the centuries. Interestingly, um, we understand now why it's such short hair that we're dealing with. Okay. It's, it's essentially been munched whilst in museum store. Right, Is that going right. to limit what information? Well, we it just can get means from? that um, whereas we would like to build up as long a timeline as yeah. possible, yeah. Uh, we're only limited to about three centimetres, about three months' worth okay. of data. Three months' worth of dietary information could still be enough to pinpoint the kind of environment the mummy lived in but the sample will need to be thoroughly cleaned before it can be submitted for a stable isotope test. To further explore the theory the mummy is Chankai, Joanne will use the same scanning electron microscope to examine the textiles found on the dead Peruvian. For South American native populations, textiles could be as valuable as gold. And lacking a written language, they used designs on textiles to record important information. 
These precious fabrics can be a crucial factor in determining both culture and a person's role in society. Joanne takes the fabric sample to Rob Janaway. He's a forensic archaeologist who specializes in the analysis of ancient textiles. He'll examine five tiny strands taken from the mummy's headband under the scanning electron microscope. The examination should reveal more about their exact origin. We can use very, very small samples on this scanning electron microscope and we can get away with a couple of millimetres of yarn and because they're so well preserved in these dry conditions, we can identify what fibres they come from. Oh, that's great news. As you can see here, what we've got, this is running at about two and a half thousand times. We can see the surface of the fibre and you can see that we've got this characteristic twist and a collapsed tube-like structure, which is absolutely typical of cotton. Oh, so we've got cotton. Yeah, yeah, it's very clearly cotton from here. Knowing that this textile sample from the mummy is cotton, not a camelid wool from an alpaca or a llama, tells the team a lot about the mummy. Cotton is a lowland resource. Textile material can be traded over distances. Uh, but typically, cotton is grown in the river valleys, whereas uh, camelid wool tends to be associated as a highland resource from much higher up. The cloth from the mummy's headband shows the beginnings of an advanced textile technology. This was a society that had developed weaving techniques. The evidence of cotton also helps narrow down the geographical location for the mummy. Peru's central coast is crossed with river valleys where many early societies lived and where cotton still grows today. The unique combination of decorative embroidery and the colour palette of browns, yellows, reds and whites all point in the same direction. A coastal group from the 15th century renowned for their stunning textiles, the Chenkai civilization. But will Dr Andy Wilson's dietary information from the stable isotope analysis support the Chenkai theory? The process involves measuring the ratio of carbon to nitrogen in the hair fragment. A high proportion of nitrogen would indicate a protein-rich diet, whilst carbon would point to grains. The first stage is to clean the sample with organic solvents to remove contaminants. The sample is then freeze-dried. Finally, it's taken to an isotope mass spectrometer. Here, the nitrogen and carbon gases will be separated out from the sample and measured using gas chromatography a process which takes many hours to complete. The next step in the physical analysis of the mummy is to look under the skin using x-rays. Since the mummy is too frail to take to a hospital, the team have no choice but to bring a portable machine to x-ray him in situ. Exposing. These multiple x-ray images of the body will enable the team to access the hidden interior of the mummy. Besides highlighting bone damage, the results can indicate disease and possibly the cause of death. Stand clear, please. The first thing the x-rays reveal is an iron rod inside the mummy. But striking though it looks, it tells us nothing. It was almost certainly inserted by a museum curator early in the last century to hold the body together. Duncan heads back to Andy Wilson's laboratory. He's hoping to find out whether the dietary information from the stable isotope test fits with the picture the team are building of a Chankai male. The isotope data that we've got is, is telling us that we're probably dealing with maize. We've passed a, a subsistence existence, right. so... You're looking I think at agriculture. Probably a, a balance, a bit more of a balance. So you're crossing over into an agricultural sort of lifestyle of agricultural as, well as, lifestyle. as well as a subsistence right. one. This confirms what the anthropology had already told the team, that the mummy comes from a later, much more advanced culture than the Chinchorro. The stable isotope analysis has detected a high level of nitrogen in the sample, which indicates protein. The fact that we've got a high nitrogen, a high protein component to diet, in the, in the quantities that we're seeing here, does lead me to suggest that we're probably looking at an individual that was, was eating maize, was living perhaps in one of the coastal 
valleys, highlands or lowlands. Sort of we're talking. We're talking fairly close to the coast, right. I would think. Just like cotton, maize grows in coastal valleys by the sea. It's looking more and more likely that the mummy belonged to a group such as the Chankai, who inhabited these valleys close to the Pacific Ocean. They grew maize, fished to supplement their diet, and created elaborate textiles, which would have taken weeks, if not months, to make. Another critical part of the puzzle has just come in. Stephen has the results of the carbon dating. What do they tell us about our mummy? What we've got is... Um... 371 BP, uh, plus or minus 24. We've got a date between 1450 and 1520. So 1450 to 1520 AD. Mm, in Most terms likely. of yeah, in terms of culture, I wonder what ramifications that has. Could it be uh, Chiang Kai? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a good starting point. The carbon dates fit well into the period when the Chiang Kai flourished. One more indication that the mummy belonged to the Chiang Kai civilization. With all these results coming in, it's time for the team to try and put them all together. The piece of fabric that was left yeah. on the mm -hmm. headdress, apparently the backing is cotton, oh, right. which is produced in the sort of lowland mm -hmm. areas, uh, and then with this sort of uh, design applied, the colour palette of which is typical of uh, the sort of Chankai culture. That's fantastic because uh, Andrew, Andy's isotope work, the stable isotope analysis that we've been doing, he clearly showed that the diet is not purely marine, so that there's a maize element coming in there. They were growing things and in that sort of valley areas to, away from the coast. The team has made huge progress. They're confident of the mummy status as some kind of leader and that he was Chankai. But the mystery behind his burial posture and the secret of how he died still remain unsolved. Could his crushed ribcage be a factor? I'm really interested as to why this ribcage area is so jumbled and mm. separated from the rest of the body. So, so it does great merit, stuff. merit more investigation around yeah, this sure. area just to see what exactly, you know, is the history with all these various body parts and how yeah. it literally all does fit together. Yeah. Mm. Further examination of the mummy could prove whether the crushed ribcage caused his death. Joanne asks Rose Drew back to take a closer look at the bone damage. What do you think we can say about this very severe wound? The, um, the cracked ribs? Yeah. Well, this one's cracked completely in half. The whole arm is off. I think that's post-mortem damage. Yeah. And this is just splintered. It doesn't look as if it was a fresh break done near death or right before or what they call perimortem. It just doesn't look like it was a fresh bone. It just looks like a, it's just splintered. Well, surely that begs the question as well. If mm -hmm. it is post-mortem, are mm -hmm. we looking at tomb robber damage? Which certainly went on and still goes on in parts of Peru where, you know, the robbers are hacking through the, the thickness of the wrappings to get to what lies beneath, which we can only guess in this guy's case. But it, it does make you wonder about status, doesn't it? Jill has arranged to meet Nick Saunders to see whether tomb robbing is a likely explanation for the crushed ribcage. Were there incidents of tomb robbing in the region, you know, that this mummy comes from? But in terms of real tomb robbing like you find in Egypt, that really only appears when the Spanish came. Right. Uh, because then people are basically looking for gold uh, and silver. And, and we, we find these things on the mummies themselves, do we? Sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, mainly the gold and silver and sometimes gemstones were placed in and around the body in the different layers of the um, textiles that surrounded the mummy, but also on the face and around the mouth and sometimes inside the mouth. So people who were tomb robbing would, would go for those areas and damage them in cases of pieces of gold or silver. Right, OK, so this, this damage mm -hmm. to, the, to the teeth and also to the ribcage could very well be post-mortem. Yes, indeed. As treasure seekers once targeted the very parts of the body where the mummy has been damaged, it seems likely that he was attacked by tomb raiders. The fact that the burial contained enough wealth to attract robbers is further confirmation that the mummy was an important member of the community. Dr. Stephen Buckley has been working hard to identify the substances found in his minute samples. He's hoping to establish whether the body was artificially mummified, and if so, how. The chemical analysis is producing a vast amount of data that will take Stephen some time to fully analyse. Duncan Lees has used his 3D model of the mummy to solve another part of the puzzle, exactly how the body was interred. Everything to do with posture, to do with materials that have, have been lost, erosion, damage, 
it's categoric that it is a seated position for this burial. The corrosive liquids in the abdomen would have flowed down with gravity. The fact that the body has rotted beneath the stomach suggests it was buried sitting upright. When Duncan digitally rotates the body into a sitting position, it becomes clear that he was buried in what looks like the lotus position. And in order to wedge him up like this, he would have needed several layers of textiles underneath and around him. Basically what you've got going on is somebody that was buried with a significant quantity of wrappings. He would have looked remarkably similar to this wrapped mummy from Bolton Museum. Human features may well have been applied to the bundle, like this false head. To support him in this cross-legged, upright lotus position, Duncan has shown that it would have taken a large, triangular pad of fabric. Add to that the cloth used to enclose the mummy and keep it upright, and it would have been wrapped in a huge amount of precious textiles. Given that textiles were so valuable, this is another strong indication that he was both wealthy and important. Anthropologist Nick Saunders believes the mummy's seated position can reveal even more about who he was. This particular person um, was mummified sitting in this position, which basically signified his status within the culture. Uh, and connected him really through the, the spirituality of the afterlife uh, and the physicality of, of the real life uh, through posture. The spirits pass through the body and it depends on your posture and sense of who you are in society. Now, you see an extreme version of this in the later Inca period, where the Incas used to um, parade their royal Inca mummies around in Cuzco up in the Andes. Well, I have a spectacular example of this uh, in this book here. This is a royal Inca mummy being paraded around in a, in a religious ritual. And look at the posture of that mummy. Very it's similar very, to very similar to this one. So while this particular individual may have been just an ordinary chief of a fishing community on the coast, and this is a, a royal mummy of an Inca emperor, uh, the idea of status related to posture is, is very, very similar. That's extraordinary. The picture of this ancient Peruvian is now becoming clearer. All the evidence suggests he was a leader, a high-status Chancay around 30 years old who ate both fish and maize and lived near the coast. His crushed ribcage was caused after death and he was buried in an unusual lotus position supported by layers of valuable textiles. But will the chemical analysis support the team's theories? Archaeological chemist Dr. Stephen Buckley has made a massive breakthrough. The tiny samples he took from the mummy have produced two enormous piles of data which show evidence of the use of a balsam. This is a dark, fragrant liquid obtained from plants and trees. It has a consistency similar to honey. It has been used to fix the mummy's hair in life and clearly indicates a person who cared about their appearance. But Stephen has done something even more extraordinary. He's found the key to one of the great puzzles surrounding the mummy. Exactly how the body was mummified. This body has been anointed um, and treated in various ways, so it was a reasonably complex rit ritual. And so what we don't have here is straightforward natural mummification. The use of these oils and resins prove the dead man was artificially mummified. The embalming mixture contains shellfish oil, a particularly precious resource for the ancient South Americans. It also includes resin from conifer trees native to Mexico. This has come from another continent at least 2,000 miles from central Peru. Someone clearly went to a great deal of trouble to obtain these costly ingredients, further evidence that this was a man of rank. The mummy must have deserved the community's honor and respect. The team have succeeded in lifting the veil of time and getting a good sense of who this person was in life. But although the chemistry has unlocked the mystery behind the mummification, it has shed no light on the cause of his death. Don Brothwell is one of the world's leading paleopathologists. He's worked on human remains ranging from ancient bog bodies to victims of modern war crimes. If anyone can use x-rays to reveal a cause of death, it's him. 
Is there any, you know, clear cause of death, for instance? I don't think so. I mean, there's trauma of the forearm, but that's well healed. There's trauma, possibly, of the lower leg, but that's healing too. These traumas may not reveal a cause of death, but they indicate that this man suffered multiple injuries, possibly in battle, which would suggest he was a warrior. But the individual was fairly sort of um, strongly built in the shoulder area, mus from a point of view of musculature, and also, of course, used their arms strongly as well. Where the muscles attach to the bones, there is clear evidence of a strong, well-developed upper body, again, possibly that of a warrior. And no major uh, joint disease here that we can see, although joint disease wouldn't normally kill him anyway. Although Don can't pinpoint a cause of death, he spots several extraordinary features on the x-rays. The skull at the front, but be between the orbits, you should have uh, well-defined frontal sinuses showing up. There's nothing. And that's a very feminine feature. If you've got very small or even absent frontal sinuses, the, the depth of the jaw is quite small. And again, that's rather a feminine jaw, I would have thought. Whilst Rose Drew made her observations from a mere physical examination of the body, Don now has the advantage of x-rays. These reveal crucial new details and allow him to make a startling revelation. The pelvis, this sciatic notch there is very wide open instead of being rather sort of sharply angled as in the males. And the, and the femoral head is small. It seems to me it's female. This late discovery is a bombshell for the team. Sexing a skeleton is no easy task, as men and women share many physical traits. Generally, a male skeleton is larger and heavier. But two key areas are used to determine sex, the skull and the pelvis. Men are more likely to have square faces, heavy brows and bigger jaws, whilst women have high vertical foreheads, no brow ridges and smaller noses. A female pelvis is wider for childbirth, whilst a man's is narrow and heavy. The mummy's brow is very male, whereas its pelvis shows both male and female characteristics. As its genitalia have been eroded, determining the sex is a challenge. Taking DNA from the body is not an option. The necessary genetic material would almost certainly have decayed in the heat of the Peruvian climate. So X-ray analysis is by far the most reliable test. Don declaring the mummy is a woman turns the entire investigation on its head. The cultural artifacts associated with the body, the headdress and the fishing net seemed to point clearly to a male as did the evidence of strong shoulders and battle injuries. Can Jill and Joanne make sense of this startling revelation and the contradictions it implies? I mean, it I looks like somebody understand. that fought on a regular basis or had a tough, active life, very confrontational, and then the Crown says high status. The posture says high status. But we also have a very short individual as well. Four foot four. It's just... There's so, the so much four there plus going the pelvis. On, yeah does reinforce female. So, I mean, that paints a brilliant picture, doesn't it? You've got this tiny little woman with really big biceps, you know, really going for it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Amazing. But did cultures like the Chiang Kai really have high-ranking women who might have fought in battle? Joanne turns to Nick Saunders, hoping to make sense of what seems like contradictory evidence. So I really need to run a few ideas past you. Sure. Would it be possible uh, that, that this could in fact be a kind of um, high status woman within this ancient Peruvian society based on what we know about the headdress? Would this be possible? Sure, I mean, there's absolutely no problem whatsoever in having a high status woman. Um, most high status individuals were males, but it's certainly well within the realms of possibility that this was a, a high status woman of one kind or another. She could have been uh, one of those unusual examples of a female warrior, particularly if she was, uh, let's say, more mannish than, than womanish, uh, in, particularly in her physique. She could have been uh, a real warrior, or she might have been, because we have um, burial evidence, she might have been one of those who was buried with um, symbolic weapons or real weapons that were interred with her.
to give the idea of her status, but not necessarily a real woman in a uh, warrior in that sense. As the Welcome Trust has no records of how she was discovered, we'll never know whether the body was accompanied by weapons. But it seems probable from her well-developed arm muscles and her healed bone fractures that she was indeed a real warrior woman. At last, the team are in a position to make their final conclusions. Oh, wow, this is brilliant. This damage to the teeth and the rib cage could very well be post-mortem. The results are coming together to form a coherent picture of this woman. Where she came from. Fishing community, fishing village probably, but yeah. coastal Peru which culture she belonged to. Using a colour palette typical mm -hmm. of Chiang Kai. Her position in the community. So this is a real status marker that we've Absolutely. got on our mummy. But most important, the team have made sense of this enigma. This woman appears to be a high-ranking warrior. This completely contradicts what we think of as her status. She might have been expected to have been aggressive and to have gone yeah. forth in battles and things like that. Perhaps partly her stature helped her because it would have marked her out. That was part of her um, appeal, yeah. her difference, her specialness, if you like. Her cause of death may never be known, but with her battle scars, this high-status Chiang Kai woman, buried in the seated posture of the elite, was almost certainly a warrior leader. So we've gone from, you know, the dead fisherman to, uh, you know, miniature Amazon. <laughs>